Hello everybody, I'm Gary Palmer Jr., you're you, and together we are Minting Coins. So in uh, this episode, thanks for showing up. There's a lot for us to talk about today, October 4th. Uh, we're gonna be talking about why does Bitcoin want Segwit2x to add replay protection? And why does the world really need a Bitcoin ETF? Also, as IBM and Microsoft are partnering with big banks for blockchain technology, the U.S. Treasury is piloting a blockchain-based asset tracking system for uh, the monitoring of movement of physical assets and to determine whether these assets can be tracked in real time and from person to person. Plus, what's up with Mark Cuban regarding Bitcoins and ICOs? And also, we have some fresh doxing on the potential identity for Satoshi Nakamoto. So all that and more, uh, let's discuss. Uh, so, uh, you know, as always, uh, thanks for showing up. Hit that like button. Feel free to leave the comments below. Check us out on Steemit. Um, you know, what we're doing here is building a community to talk about Bitcoin and blockchain technology and to, you know, bring more people together to build us up and to add on to our knowledge of uh, what's happening in the industry. So not only do we see the dots and see what's happening in the headlines, but we're able to connect these things together and uh, really make our worlds, our communities and the, and the whole world uh a better place. Uh, so with that being said, let's jump right into the market, take a peek at the news, and let's discuss. So starting over here at coinmarketcap.com, we're living, living in a world with over 1,152 different cryptocurrencies. We have a total market capitalization of $142.8 billion, um, still approaching that $150 billion mark again, we can go in either different direction. Uh, but as uh, we've been paying attention, the, the markets uh, have been relatively pretty red. Uh, so the past 24 hour trading volume, relatively low, I would say on the lower end at $2.3 billion. And our Bitcoin BTC dominance is uh, relatively high around 49.1%. Uh, and so, um, you know, with the Bitcoin price, we see a lot of headlines that Bitcoin is eyeing the $6,000 mark to break past that $5,000 all time high. And as the Bitcoin price goes up and the rest of the alt price price uh, goes down, then that Bitcoin dominance increases. But again, what we see is that we, this happens in waves. And so we would expect to see the Bitcoin price uh, balloon. Uh, and increase according to what the experts are predicting. But, you know, in addition, when, you know, when that blooms, then it's likely we'll see a lot of those profits being taken out either, you know, in some cases for cash and for fiat, but in a lot of other cases, that money coming in to then invest and to reallocate people's portfolios uh, on the disproportionate other altcoins, which do have tremendous amounts of value. So, for example, we've talked about this in the past, looking at the Litecoin price versus the Bitcoin price and recognizing that, you know, more or less, there's been about a one or two percent parity between the price. And so, you know, um, forty two dollars would be that one percent. And so we're at fifty one dollars. And so. Uh, if we were to see the, the price of Bitcoin shoot up to $6,000, I think it's reasonable uh, to, to then see, you know, because of the effect of that money trickling through the rest of the crypto ecosystem, uh, some of the other, you know, coins increase. And so this isn't investment advice, but this is just something to look out for in terms of theory, uh, just to see if you can sort of play the game of crypto to uh, understand the relationships which aren't always intuitive, which are uh, a lot of times counter to what either a, a human would normally feel, normally think, right? We want to buy when we see it in the news, but we know that when we see it in the news, the all-time high, that's probably not the best time to buy it. And uh, also it's just natural human instinct when the price is crashing and the price is falling, then we think that that's a bad opportunity, but we know that professional traders, they're actually purchasing when coins are at all time lows, and then they're either holding or selling when those coins are at all time highs. Um, this is just to sort of foreshadow the things that are to come because honestly, this can go in any direction. We can see this Bitcoin price drop to 
3,000 to 2,000 to 1,000 dollars, uh, or we could see this price pop up to to 10,000 dollars in a matter of weeks or in a matter of in a matter of months even. Uh, and so, if and when that happens, uh, just understanding these relationships and what to look out for. So, looking at these prices in terms of Bitcoin price. Uh, Ripple up a couple points, uh, dash up a little bit on some good news and some uh, good integrations with some other companies and technologies. Uh, they're just coming off of their conference. And uh, let's see, anything else there looks strong? Um, we're getting bad news for BitShares being removed from Bitrix um, because of the uh, connection with the securities tokens as a securities asset. Uh, it's possible that we could see Waves experience that same sort of uh, purging uh, since waves you know is a is a technology that allows people to in some cases maybe maybe in a lot of cases issue uh, securities crypto security securities assets uh, yeah also this this uh, eos which I'm you know I, I think it's very interesting and overall I'm a, I'm a supporter I think what was done with steam and steam it has been amazing so I think eos will uh, bring a lot of value to the community, but because we're having this year-long uh, ICO with EOS, there's just more and more EOS being created every day into the market, and so as more and more EOS is being created, and people take that EOS and they or the EOS or however we pronounce this here, and they sell it, that, I know back on the, the market for Bitcoin or for or for what, whatever uh, that's not EOS. It's actually in, you know decre decreasing the value of everybody else who's holding EOS, and so uh, this just seems as if the value is going to drop down a lot more uh, before this value goes up, uh, and so you know that is unfortunately what it is there. Uh, yeah, and then we just have Pivx here. Pivx, a, a great staking coin, 100% proof of stake blockchain technology. Uh, Pivx, you know, was on the decline, but has recently popped back up. This has been a relatively super stable coin over the past, mm, let's say, four or five months. Uh, really, since it popped on the scene, you know, watching it go from a dollar to two dollars to three dollars. Uh, you can see the really strong consistency in uh, Pivx's um, development. We can also see the really strong consistency in Pivx's marketing and the people who are just, you know, keeping top uh, world class communication, letting people know what's going on, what's happening, uh, you know, what what is m moving and jiving in terms of the development and the community of the Pivx, of the Pivx technology. And so Pivx continues to look like a, a great opportunity uh, moving forward. All right. So uh, starting over at uh, Reddit.com and taking a look at what people are, are talking about in terms of the Segwit 2X. Uh, with the Segwit 2X, we have this Bitcoin hard fork that we keep on talking about. This hard fork is going to be coming around in November. And so when uh, Segwit 2X hard forks, uh, the, you know, the Bitcoin BTC people want Segwit 2X to have what's known as replay protection. We want the replay protection to make sure that when someone spends... Uh, Bitcoin or Segwit 2x coin that the when they're not going to be sending both types of token. So uh, when Bitcoin Cash materialized onto the scene, uh, it added replay detection, so the replay protection, so that someone could send their Bitcoin or their BTC and not have to worry about the opposite token, uh, you know, being sent as well with it and and double spending both of those coins at the same time. And so the Segwit 2x folks seem to be having some resistance to adding the replay protection to Bitcoin, which is just a continued uh, sort of theme of um, decisions which does not seem or feel or in any way represent alignment of the community and the values of protecting people in a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer sort of world. And so this is just something that I want to bring to your attention to help you realize that when people are making decisions that aren't in the best interest of the overall community, and it's going to be dividing the community at some point, that might come back to you. And at some point, that come might come back to divide you and, and what you have. And then 
you know, damage your position. So uh, in terms of the replay protection for the Segwit 2X, just recognize that this is something that's important. This is something that would protect the Segwit 2X coin and the BTC coin. And so just keep an eye on what you hear about this continuing to increase or decrease. So then we have uh, more people talking in Reddit and just uh, people who are just very upset with all of the businesses that are supporting the Segwit2x and uh, just recognizing how it's a very, very unpopular sort of position, uh, you know, in terms of what the community is thinking and what the community is feeling overall. And there's a lot of people who are supporting the Segwit2x who have, you know, supported other things as well, such as the uh, Bitcoin Cash people like... Um, just all sorts of people, uh, you know, Roger Ver comes to mind, Jihan Wu, Gavin Anderson, um, all, all sorts of people, Vinny Lingham, um, all sorts of people who have supported this contentiousness in terms of the development of the technology. It's, it's definitely really um, interesting to see the division and it'll be really interesting to see how the community does come together and how Bitcoin survives and continues to be a, an extremely strong coin. And we have Charlie Lee, uh, Charlie Lee, no 2x retweeting uh, that the one good thing that's going to come out of the November Segwit 2x hard fork is that people will finally realize the hash rate does not dictate consensus. And so what we've noticed here over at this uh, channel at Minting Coins is that the as the hash rate goes up, we've noticed that the price per Bitcoin has also gone up. And what Charlie Lee is saying here is that just because the hash rate is going up and the price is going up doesn't mean that the people with the hash rate, the miners, are going to be able to dictate the, the future direction of Bitcoin. It's really a larger group of people that make these decisions, even though the miners play a critical role for securing the network and for increasing the value of the overall token. Um, they're not the centralized authority who get to rule Bitcoin. Uh, then over at Reddit, we have this clip with uh, this one gentleman from BlackRock. His name is Mark uh, Wildman. And so uh, Mark is being interviewed uh, on, geez, what, what show was this? This is on Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg Markets. And so he goes on to say that he uh, quite doesn't get the point of a Bitcoin ETF. Now, Mark is not a proponent of Bitcoin. Uh, Mark is, you know, relatively anti-Bitcoin. He doesn't think it's a long-term value. He doesn't think it's a long-term store of value. He doesn't think it's trusted or secure or um, or anything like that. And so he, th he believes in the stock market. He believes in the S&P. And uh, but he is saying something really smart about Bitcoin and he is saying something, um, you know, when they're comparing and contrasting a Bitcoin ETF versus the S&P, uh, you know, they go on to say that the S&P sort of deserves an ETF because, you know, when someone wants to buy the S&P, it's really difficult to purchase 500 stocks all at once and so it makes sense to have the s p index so someone can just purchase the one and they can have the mixture of all of it and have that sort of um, position in their portfolio but a bitcoin etf what's the difference between having you know big like a bitcoin only etf and just holding your own bitcoin i mean that's what a lot of people who are you know who are not financial uh, in the financial industry, it's what they say about Bitcoin. Why would I want to have a centralized authority hold my Bitcoin in an ETF when I could just hold my own private keys? And what they're saying, what Mark is saying, and is really exactly right. You don't need a Bitcoin ETF to hold Bitcoin. You don't need an Ethereum Classic ETF to hold Ethereum Classic. You don't need an, an Ethereum uh, ETF to hold uh, Ether. And so, uh, I mean, I suppose what would make sense is if, is that if you had some sort of index of the top 100 tokens, like the S&P 500 is the top 500, uh, you know, most most important, uh, you know, companies and, uh, you know, the way that they measure that. I'm not going to get into how the S&P works versus the NASDAQ versus the Dow Jones. But if they had like... Uh, 
uh, Crypto 100. That was the top 100 tokens, and it was like one token of each of those, and that was an ETF. Maybe that would make sense. Uh, I, I don't even know. I don't even think it makes a lot of sense. So ETFs are important if you uh, have a 401k and your 401k has to go into very particular type of investment vehicles that have gold ETFs you can put your 401k into. And so the only case that would make sense for you know, us to have a Bitcoin ETF or you know, common people to have a Bitcoin ETF would be to put that 401k money that you couldn't otherwise purchase Bitcoin directly or gold directly or anything directly, take that uh, ET, that 401k money and put it into a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, maybe then it would make sense. Um, otherwise, the ETFs market, the futures market, what's that, what is that going to do? Well, it's going to increase the demand. It's going to increase the number of these large players that have Bitcoin or want Bitcoin for their ETFs. Then lots of people are going to be, you know, uh, signing up to be a part of that ETF for lots of different reasons. Let it be they know what they're doing or they don't know what they're doing. And it's going to inflate the price of Bitcoin, which is going to be great for Bitcoin overall and for all the holders of Bitcoin. But it does create all of these different tools, these vehicles, these, these you know, uh, processes and procedures and, and uh, systems that could have um, the potential to affect... Uh, the Bitcoin market in a coordinated sort of way, right? When you're bidding on the price of Bitcoin in the future and you're bidding on Bitcoin the current price and you're um, uh, fractional reserve lending to trade Bitcoin, um, it can create a, a, you know, an interesting psychology, which I think um, traditional uh, players inside markets recognize as different ways to hedge their bets. Uh, and by hedging these different bets, you know, you can sort of push the market in one direction or another. So overall, um, you know, these Bitcoin ETFs are, are going to increase in popularity. They will get approved over time as the large institutional players want to have these. And the point for you is that, you know, if, if you were to hold and own and be the only person that had access to your private keys, then that Bitcoin would be truly yours. But if you don't have access to your private keys, then, you know, like, say, for example, you have your Bitcoin just sitting in Coinbase. Like if, if Coinbase is holding uh, one million different Bitcoins, you know, if they add up everyone's accounts like a bank account and add it together, it says, you know, everyone together has one million Bitcoins. Does Coinbase really have one million Bitcoins to back that up? I'm not exactly sure. Do the other exchanges have all that to back it up? If everyone went to all the exchanges all at once and pulled out all their Bitcoin all at once, like back in the day with Mt. Gox, would everyone be able to get their Bitcoin out um, or not? Because, you know, that would sort of be those exchanges almost running like a Ponzi scheme or a fractional reserve bank. Very similar, same thing, right? Um, and so bottom line, hold those private keys. I know this was a long rant into that, but it's really, really important because these sort of massive uh, systems like the Bitcoin ETFs are going to uh, increase like the ICOs that are increasing in 2017. The financial vehicles and the financial systems will be increasing in 2018 and 2019. Mark my words. Um, and we're starting to see this when we look at some of the top news from today, like how IBM is partnering with big banks in the blockchain trade to trade uh, finance and to shake up finance and to shake up traditionally how things are happening and, and how things are working. And so IBM has joined the United Bank of Switzerland group uh, and they're working on this blockchain trade platform with these major global banks. So this future product is going to be called Batavia. And Batavia is going to be helping banks and their clients to automate trade finance processing, which remains a highly manual paper process, a lot of people, a lot of paper, a lot of time, and having so much people, having so much paper and having so much time that runs these processes and procedures can really uh, add, a, you know, by eliminating that and replacing it with distributed ledger technology or by removing that and, and replacing it with blockchain, you know, real blockchain technology. Uh, we can increase the efficiency, we can increase the transaction time, and we can increase the overall amount of volatility, liqui liquidity, and profit potential that's there to be made. Um, 
And so the Batavia is going to be helping to facilitate the, the trading platform. And this is being developed by IBM for these major banks across the world, um, joining the United Bank of Switzerland group. Um, and so IBM has made a lot of progress in the blockchain space. And there's been a lot of news coming out uh, around IBM and, uh, and around what they're doing in the blockchain space. And overall, they, they go on. So there's a quote here from uh, from them, digitizing and creating a level of trust is a perfect accelerator for business. And so that's what IBM is doing is that they're digitizing the, the processes, they're digitizing the procedures, they're digitizing these systems into the network, and it's creating a level of trust associated with blockchain technology. Uh, this, you know, that everyone is that, that everyone knows is the new way of, of trusting information, trusting messages, trusting money. And this is going to just like the Internet was a perfect accelerator, uh, being able to create the, these levels of efficiency for communication. Now, what's happening with blockchain is going to be an accelerator uh, in, in the same sort of lights. And then it's important to note that IBM has a competitor. That competitor is Microsoft. They're, they're en uh, enemies and friends, maybe they're frenemies, but they do have competing uh, interests in a lot of different aspects. And so as Microsoft is realizing this news about IBM and seeing what IBM is doing in the space, and IBM is looking at Microsoft, this is gonna further push, further acceler accelerate, further facilitate the uh, competitiveness, the investment, the uh, coordination of these technology companies other blockchain companies and traditional financial systems um, uh, organizations, the you know companies in the industry, to really bring the world to this next level. <clears throat> and so, a part of this next level uh, of of technology companies and traditional financial institutions, we talked about this is the government levels. And uh, this, I, I suppose the intermediary between the government level and the traditional financial institutions would be the U.S. Treasury. And what we see here is the U.S. Treasury also getting their toes wet, getting their ankles wet. Um, they might be going knee deep in at this point, but the U.S. Treasury is piloting this uh, you know, blockchain-based asset tracking system. And so they, they call it a blockchain-based asset tracking system. Why do they call it blockchain-based asset tracking system? Probably because it's not actually going to be a blockchain. So we talked about this in yesterday's video that there's a, you know, in my opinion, major differences between blockchain technology and distributed ledger technology, abbreviated DLT. And so blockchain technology to me is just much more decentralized. It's much, much more, you know, it, it's, it's not just distributed among people and places that are known, but it's uh, highly decentralized so that you can't even necessarily connect all the people who are running um, or could run the, the blockchain technology. But the U.S. Department of Treasury's Bureau of Fiscal Services is going to be piloting the use of, you know, instead of the blockchain technology, this DLT, this distributed ledger technology. And what they're going to be doing specifically, what they're going to be seeking to do, is to going to be to monitor the movement of different physical assets like smartphones and computers. Um, and uh, right now they're saying smartphones and computers, but you know anyone would be able to use this technology, I suppose, in the future, and they would be able to monitor the movement of any asset. Let that be um, trade goods, or let that be parts for systems, or products, or um, you know, people or people that have certain positions. I mean, this is sort of, you know, could be applied to anything in the world. Uh, the contractor that's going to be working on this is yet to be named. <clears throat> It'll be really interesting to see who that person is and what their background is in terms of the philosophy of uh, blockchain technology and distributed ledger systems. But, uh, you know, further uh, as a part of this project, they want to determine specifically whether the physical asset can be tracked and reconciled in real time and as the physical product is transferred from person to person. Um, and it, so that's, that's, what the, that's what they're looking to do so they can hold uh, more efficiency, more accountability, and better customer service opportunities uh, across the different government agencies. And so as quoted here, what they're looking to have the greatest impact with using this technology is to increase the efficiency to increase the accountability 
and to increase the the customer service overall. I mean, you know, if the customer service is happy of your audience that you're trying to serve, then, you know, you must be doing a great job in terms of the efficiency and accountability in terms of delivering whatever your mission is uh, based on your objectives, right? <clears throat> and so that's that's the U.S. Treasury. That's what's happening with this uh, digital uh, distributed ledger technology. Um, so they can track these physical assets that they're purchasing for the government, and this will be uh, you know government you know further government implementation of this technology. This yet to be named contractor. You know, could this be IBM? Could this be Microsoft? Could this be you know a, a, you know some other uh, highly credible? individual um that'll be really interesting who's going to be fighting for the contract to you know work on this for the the u.s department of treasuries uh you know sort of initiative um it's really interesting to see how the financial services are coming together uh to support the the bitcoin blockchain technology and you know in, in a lot of cases bitcoin as well uh, because while businesses and organizations and governments are really focused more on the the technology and they really want to get away from Bitcoin because you know Bitcoin is a threat, but the technology is a huge huge asset. But Bitcoin being a threat, you know we see people who are pro technology, people who understand the technology, saying very good things about the technology. But on the other hand, we see people who don't say good things about the technology. And some of the people who don't say good things about the technology, about Bitcoin or blockchain technology, sometimes it's because they don't understand the technology. Sometimes it's because they have a competitive interest. Maybe they're someone who sells gold. And so if you sell gold, then you would definitely hate Bitcoin because Bitcoin would definitely cut into your gold profits. Um, and, and that would not be good. So if you sold Bitcoin, you would hate gold. <clears throat> Um, um, do, 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 or if you sold if you sold gold, you would hate Bitcoin. And um, what else here? Or if you wanted to purchase Bitcoin cheap, then you could say lots of bad things about Bitcoin, like Jamie Dimon did, and then immediately have you know other parts of J.P. Morgan Chase you know purchase Bitcoin at you know extremely low prices, considering that we were just at an all time high of five thousand, and then they were able to purchase these prices much much lower. Um, you know, so they had a competitive interest in saying something bad about Bitcoin. And, you know, in, in the past, we've talked about Mark Cuban talking about Bitcoin. And so uh, in today's news, we have Mark Cuban and you can go check this out. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to play a lot of videos on this channel just because it seems as if um, any little reason that YouTube has to cancel our videos, uh, they cancel the videos. And so uh, that's why we stopped playing videos uh, on the station just to, you know, and that's why we removed links from the channel and from the videos. So that's why if you want to get any of the links, you need to go to, to Steam it because um, we are just, we just having so many of our videos blacklisted, demonetized, and just straight up kicked off of Google or not Google, but YouTube. Um, I don't want to play any of these videos, but definitely check this out. And this is Mark Cuban uh, talking. And uh, Mark Cuban, who previously said Bitcoin was a fraud, that Bitcoin was a Ponzi scheme, and then the Bitcoin price you know, immediately suffered after that was widely publicized across the world. Well, now we come to find out two different things in this video. We find out, one, that Mark Cuban has since purchased a position in Bitcoin. He says it's relatively small, but for someone who's a billionaire, that has billions and billions of dollars locked up, you know, if you buy a million dollars or $10 million, that's, that's a bunch of Bitcoin, you know, even 40 40 million dollars but that's still relatively small for someone with billions of dollars right the second thing uh, is that he also confirms uh, his involvement in an ICO and uh, some sort of altcoin we're not going to get into that right now but you know how quickly some people go from saying bad things uh, when they're not in the market and then watching it crash jumping in the market and then going on to then support the blockchain the technology now whatever that Mark Cuban is doing this, that's fine. That's his prerogative. That's, you know, that's his game. And, you know, even if he did it by accident, good for him. The point that I'm bringing this up to you is to help you recognize that when other people are saying these things in the news and you see that affect the market price, that you want to have a lot of caution that you're not one of the sheeple out there that are just following the, the lemmings to jump over the cliff when, um, when, you know, 
over and over and over again, the, the, the boys crying wolf or, or whatever analogy that you have. And over and over again, we see the Bitcoin price hold stable, uh, the Bitcoin price um, gain more popularity, the Bitcoin, um, the network itself just have more utility and more application as every year we have a new country or a couple new countries that are seeing their national reserves just hyper inflate. And instead of people moving to the dollar, we see people in those countries moving to Bitcoin because Bitcoin is trusted, because Bitcoin is safer, because Bitcoin is secure, because Bitcoin doesn't have a third party middleman or, or, uh, or just like these, these uh, dollar notes that someone can just snatch out of your pocket in the middle of the night. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, just, just recognize that while Jamie Dimon was saying bad things, JP Morgan Chase was purchasing Bitcoin while Mark Cuban was saying bad things. He since purchased a bunch of Bitcoin is now working on his own CI own ICO. And this is going to happen over and over again. So try not to get fooled. All right. Last but not least in today's show, we have, uh, this information coming to us via Reddit and 4chan. Uh, not sure if you're familiar with uh, 4chan at all, but it is an interesting website where you can get, I would say, the best of people and the worst of people. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's similar to Reddit, and in a lot of ways, it's similar to the rest of the world, uh, but it's definitely its own sort of place as well. And so what these internet researchers have uh, found out and then since posted there, and this information is really you know, hitting the web, is that somebody purchased the domain name smartcontract.com and they purchased it about six days before Satoshi Nakamoto released the white paper. Um, and so uh, we see here the registration date for this is October 25th, 2008. Um, and uh, it was bought by this uh, gentleman, Sergey. And he bought it six days before Satoshi published his first Bitcoin article. Um, definitely very interesting. And, uh, you know, that before Satoshi mentioned Bitcoin and wrote about Bitcoin when no one was really thinking about, you know, Bitcoin uh, and, and people, you know, knew that this, pro what, this problem was a problem that had not been solved and was probably unsolvable at that point. Uh, someone had purchased smart contract, you know, just days before this happened. And uh, someone posted down here, I thought this was good. <clears throat> so we have the creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto. Now we have the purchaser six days before the release of the white paper, uh, smartcontract.com, Sergey Nazarov. And here we have Sergoshi Nazomoto. <laughs> So, uh, St. Nicholas, uh, I don't know. So very, very interesting there. Um, and so maybe this, I'm guessing this is a picture of whoever the, the Sergei gentleman is. And, uh, and that is that, that, that is, uh, what we have. This could be the guy, this could not be the guy. Um, I'm sure we're going to be learning more about this as time goes on. It's definitely very, very interesting indeed. Um, but thanks for showing up. Thanks for learning about uh, all this with me. Thanks for reviewing the news with me today. Thank you for checking out the markets with me today, um, I, especially the market recap. I find it uh, you know, really beneficial personally to you know, every morning to go to coinmarketcap.com and just go over these high level numbers, you know, because noticing, hey, there's two more cryptocurrencies listed here today than there were yesterday, right? Did you catch that? And just, you know, getting a sense for where the market cap is and getting a sense for what the trading volume is and getting a sense for what the dominance is because any one of these points, any one of these, you know, just pieces of information is interesting by itself, but by itself does not have meaning. Knowing that the Bitcoin market cap is $70 billion doesn't have meaning unless you know what the Bitcoin market cap was, you know, 30 days ago or one year ago. And so by keeping a, a, a attention and by keeping your finger on the pulse of the market and the news, it's really going to give you greater strength, greater knowledge, greater understanding. It's going to help incorporate this into your, um, you know, your every everyday sort of understanding of what Bitcoin is. Uh, and what are these different aspects about Bitcoin? You know, why do we need replay protection? You know, uh, help, you know, ask yourself questions like why isn't Segwit 2x adding replay protection? 
um, asking yourself questions like, you know, is a Bitcoin ETF, you know, when that happens, is that going to increase the price of Bitcoin? When a Bitcoin ETF happens, is that going to allow the potential for more manipulation? You might not know the answers, but it's important that we just think about these things uh, to, to just understand what's happening in terms of the development that Microsoft is making, that IBM is making. If you are paying attention to what they're doing and the technologies are, that they're putting out, that's going to give you an insight into not just how the world is going to be changing, but maybe, you know, good opportunities to, you know, companies to, you know, put, you know, money behind the stock of their corporation or, you know, just to, uh, you know, ask your financial advisor about, you know, financial, you know, your financial advice, because you definitely don't want to get that from here. And you definitely want to uh, put this information together yourself, because you shouldn't trust, you know, anybody online, you shouldn't trust anything you read, you should take in information, but you really want to do your own research, you really want to uh, pay attention for yourself and put this information together for yourself, and then to ask questions and to bring other people into the conversation to get other people to understand uh, the best that you can explain to them, but then to get them to ask questions as well. And we all need to start asking more questions and just not being reactionary to the, the hype or the FUD. So with that being said, you know, tap that like button. Thanks for showing up. Uh, if you have any questions, put those questions in the comment box below. Uh, let me know what you think about the replay protection for the Segwit 2X. And, um, or, you know, let me know what you think about this whole identity of Satoshi, even though it really doesn't even matter anymore, right? Um, but there's just a, a lot happening. I would love to know your thoughts uh, about everything we have going on. But um, we'll be in talks uh, again soon. We'll be putting out a video hopefully tomorrow. And until then, I'm glad that together we are minting coins.